All right. I think I think we are live. Um, can you just let me know in the chat button uh, if you can hear me, folks? Great. So I'm getting some confirmation on chat. Uh, Jamuna says she can hear me. Okay, great. Kiran, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Awesome, awesome. So I've got a confirmation from Shristi as well. Amazing. So it looks like you guys, you guys can hear me. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this um, the second session in this series. So uh, I, I don't know how many of you. Some of you might have joined us last week. We started this series on Friday last week where what we're going to do is we're going to discuss actual passages from CAT 2020. Okay, so we discussed two passages last week um, from slot one, which appeared in CAT 2020 last year. And we're going to discuss the remaining two passages of slot one. So every slot had four passages. We discussed two last week and now we're going to discuss two more today. Okay, all right. So um, we're going to we'll start the passage reading and stuff in about a couple of minutes. Uh, some of you are still joining in. Um, just a quick introduction. So if you are attending my session for the first time, uh, my name is Jatin. I'm a verbal ability coach in at 2IM where I take care of um, obviously verbal ability coaching primarily for CAT and GMAT. So of course, I look at all competitive exams, but uh, my focus is on CAT and uh, GMAT as well. OK. Um, so, yeah, and I'm also part of the interviewing team that does uh, interview training. So, as you know, for after CAT, you have a personal interview round, which is also very critical. So I'm a part of the team that takes care of that, the training as well as the mock interviews as well. Right. So, for instance, this season, the season that just went by uh, for CAT 2020 students, um, I conducted a bunch of mock interviews and I'm very happy to let you know that, uh, that about 100 plus students from our institute have actually now going to prestigious B schools across the country, right? Um, so yeah, so that's my role here. Just a bit of a background about me. So um, I have about 18 plus years of corporate experience and uh, out of which 12 plus years was spent at Google. So I was working at Google till last year, till July 2020, where um, in these 12 plus years, I, I was in different sort of departments and roles across digital marketing, sales and operations. Right. Um, training also has been a very recurrent theme in my career. So, you know, at Google, I did like several part time training initiatives. And before Google, my full time role for about four and a half years was with an IT company where I used to teach programming. Right. That's like a that's like almost like a past life now. It's way back, way back in time. Uh, but yeah, training, as you can see, has been a recurrent theme. Now, the obvious question is, why did I quit Google? Well, the reason for that is um, I'm very passionate about two things. I'm very passionate about teaching. And I'm very pas passionate about the English language. So uh, last year, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to sort of switch careers and, and take this up full time. And that's why I decided to quit Google and take up English training and coaching full time. OK, right. So yeah, so that's me. Um, now, what we'll do today is, as I said, uh, we can start with the actual uh, actual session. So we'll start with uh, we're going to discuss on the agenda today. We're going to discuss two actual passages from slot one in cat we discussed two last time so if you remember if you were there or if you've seen the recording we discussed anarchy and elephant seals right those were the two passages that we discussed today we're going to discuss the remaining two passages of slot one okay right so now before we begin uh <clears throat> see uh, I, I always repeat this and I, i'm hoping that most of you have already read these passages the link to these passages is available in the description of this video Right. So you can click on that link and you will get the uh, passages in sort of like a on the on a website. Right. So you can read it there as well. But I'm really hoping that most of you would have gone through the passages beforehand. Um, so that's the whole idea of this session. Just remember it for next time as well. Please go through these passages beforehand. Um, just read them. You don't have to read the questions or solve the questions. I'll take you through. I'll take you through my explanation of the passage and then we'll solve the questions together. OK. But to make best use of the session, please go through these passages beforehand from next time onward, onwards if you haven't done that already. Okay. 
all right great so just give me one second and we will start perfect so let's get started folks with um, with the first passage that we're going to discuss today um <clears throat> Now, before we begin, just remember one thing I tell this, I, I, I say this every time uh, we, we begin discussing an RC, right? One very important element of reading is to read with a lot of interest and curiosity, right? You, no matter what the topic is, irrespective of the topic, right? Tell your mind, tell your mind that, uh, you know, you should read with interest and curiosity, right? And a lot of energy and believe me, that will help in comprehension, okay? Right. So just 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 tell your mind that, right? It's sort of like a trick which will really help you to understand this passage better. Um, get immersed in the passage, right? So read it with a lot of curiosity, read it with a lot of interest, and be an active reader, right? So show some energy when you're reading this, uh, when you're reading passage, and follow this for all reading materials, irrespective of what you're reading. It will really help you to understand what you're reading, right? Because you're becoming an active reader. If you're a passive reader. And you're like, oh, this topic is boring. It's too lengthy. Uh, I don't understand certain words and all of that. Then it's going to affect your comprehension. Okay. So interest, curiosity, and and energy, right? So let's let's sort of exhibit that and let's start reading this passage. So we'll read it together. You have a link as well in the description. You can click on the link and see the passage there as well. All right. Okay. Now let's go through it. So again, ignore the title, this title, cat passages, by the way, uh, in your exam, you'll never have a title of the passage, right? This is just there as a placeholder. So ignore the title. Don't let the title bias you about the content. The title is not important here. You won't have a title in the exam. Okay. What does it say? Few realize that the government of China governing an empire of some 60 million people during the Tang dynasty implemented a complex financial system that recognized grains, coins, and textiles as money. Interesting. So what does it say? So it says government of China implemented a financial system that recognized grains, coins and textiles as money. Right. So this is this is pretty interesting. Right. This is sort of give you an give you an idea. And of course, the time frame is also mentioned. This is way back in time. So that's why they were using not only coins, but grains and textiles as money as well. Right. So quite interesting. Coins did have certain advantages. OK, so it's starting with coins out of the three. They were durable recognizable and provided a convenient medium of exchange especially for smaller transactions okay so it talks about the advantages of coins great however there were also disadvantages now see this is a trigger word by the way whenever you see however right what will typically happen in a passage is however will tell you something opposite to what has been mentioned before right so it's talking about advantages however is a trigger word that will tell you that most likely He's going to talk about opposite of advantages, which is disadvantages, right? So remember that trigger word. However, there were also disadvantages. Okay. A continuing shortage of copper meant that government mints could not produce enough coins for the entire empire to the extent that for most of the dynasty's history, coins constituted only a tenth of the money supply. Okay, so there was a supply issue with coins, is what it's saying, right? Um, the government wasn't able to enough mint enough uh, money because of uh, a shortage of copper and that's why there was a problem in supply so this was the disadvantage at that time of having coins okay all right one of the main objections to calls for taxes to be paid in coin was that peasant producers who could weave cloth or grow grain okay the other two major currencies of the tang would not be able to produce coins and therefore would not be able to pay their taxes okay now this sentence here can be a little confusing Okay, so what it says is that there was an objection. So we're talking about disadvantages of coins, right? Remember, sort of maintain that flow. So this is another disadvantage. The government was asking for taxes to be paid in coins. And the objection that peasant producers had was the producers who were weaving cloth or grow grain, they were not able to produce coins, obviously, right? These producers were weaving cloth and growing grain. So they preferred to pay the taxes in cloth and grain. They were not able to produce coins and therefore were not able to pay their taxes. That was the objection for uh, from peasant producers uh, 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 towards the government asking to pay taxes in coins. Okay, so again a disadvantage disadvantage of coins, right? So look at this paragraph. Now what we do is whenever we read a para whenever we read this passage, right? We always uh, go paragraph by paragraph and we try to figure out the main idea of this paragraph. 
okay so what is the main idea of this paragraph here we've we've read it okay so you know that okay it starts by saying uh, there was a financial system that the government of china had which had grains coins and textiles and then it starts talking about coins so it talks about the advantages of coins and it talks about the disadvantages of coins so if you think about it of course there is an intro which will typically be there for every passage but the main idea here is there is advantages and disadvantages of coins that have been discussed in this paragraph right so you can make a small note like this in and, and you can follow the strategy in the exam as well you have your um, <clears throat> uh, the 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 flip book that's given to you the notepad so you can always take small small notes the advantage of taking quick notes is it also helps in comprehension right so the moment you write something down okay the moment you write something down it sort of helps you in comprehension it registers in your brain that's why we take small notes again these notes have to be quick you don't have to write full sentences okay it's primarily for you to sort of comprehend and not lose the flow of the passage a lot of times i hear students saying oh you know i'm reading a passage i start with a lot of like concentration but you know in the middle of the passage i lose concentration i lose the connect so if you take notes for every paragraph it will help you to not lose the flow of the passage okay all right so yeah so that is that is advantages and disadvantages of coins that have been discussed and there are many advantages and disadvantages just keep that in mind let's proceed as coins had advantages and disadvantages okay great this was discussed in the previous paragraph so the second paragraph obviously is connecting to the previous paragraph so as coins had had disadvantages and advantages so did textiles so now it's gone to talking about textiles remember it spoke about coins textiles and grains right as three forms of currency it spoke about coins looks like now it's going to textiles okay now what were the textiles advantages and disadvantages that's what it's talking about if in circulation for a long period of time they could show signs of wear and tear okay so looks like it's talking about the disadvantage of textile just give me a second one second folks sorry about this for for some reason the temperature it's it's gotten a, it's gotten a bit hot in my room i don't know for what, for what reason but anyway um sorry for the interruption let's proceed okay so as coin said advantages and disadvantages so did textiles so we are talking about now textiles now if in circulation for a long period of time they could show signs of wear and tear all right so textiles obviously is cloth if it's in circulation for a long time it will show signs where wear and tear that makes sense stained faded and torn bolts of textiles had less value than a brand new bolt okay so textiles you know if they're stained faded and torn what it's saying is that it will have less value it's a currency remember than a brand new bolt and that's a problem you know because it's it shows signs of wear and tear furthermore a full bolt had a particular value okay if consumers cut textiles into smaller pieces to buy or sell something worth less than a full bolt that too greatly lessened the value of the textiles okay now let's focus on the sentence what does it say furthermore a full bolt had a particular value now see chances are that you might not know what bolt is okay don't worry see everybody will see certain words in the passages right where you might not be familiar with words because it's not possible to be familiar with like 100% familiar with all the words right that's not possible so if you get an odd word which you're not familiar with don't let that throw you off right what you should do is you should try to understand this word with the context and this is very simple to understand what does it say furthermore a full bolt had a particular value if consumers cut textiles that greatly lessen the value of the textiles so you can understand using the context and when i say context i mean like the sentence is around that word okay so if you look at this sentence you can understand that bolt is most likely a unit of measurement okay because they talk about like it has a particular value if you cut it the value gets lessened so it is something to do with a unit of measurement okay so you can understand that from context you don't need to know the meaning beforehand right okay so it says that if they cut it it will lessen the value of the textiles unlike coins textiles could not be used for small transactions as an official noted textiles could not be exchanged by the foot and the inch okay so again this whole paragraph talks about the disadvantages of textiles right 
first we had coins then it says textiles and then it talks about the disadvantages so wear and tear then it talks about you cut it the value lessens and also unlike coins you can't use it for small transactions so coins you can use it for small transactions textiles you can't these were the disadvantages or the limitations of textiles right okay i hope you're with me till now so uh, remember what we have discussed till now we have discussed um, three currencies then we've discussed advantages and disadvantages of coins and now we've discussed disadvantages of textiles okay all right let's move on but textiles had some advantages okay great so simple structure right it's talking about disadvantages now it's talking about textiles advantages of textiles over coins so there is a comparison with coins for a start textile production was widespread okay and there were fewer problems with the supply of textiles okay now if you remember from the pa previous paragraph coins had a supply issue because copper was limited what it's saying is that textile doesn't didn't have that issue right because the production was widespread for large transactions textiles weighed less than the equivalent in coins since a string of coins could weigh as much as 4 kg okay so what is it saying again remember it's comparing textiles with coins that's what the paragraph is doing okay so first it says the supply issue is not there with textiles and for large transactions textiles is a better fit because coins again think think about it right coins for large transactions will weigh a lot it says it will it, it would weigh as much as 4 kg for a large transactions textiles would weigh much less than coins so looks like it's saying that textiles is most more suited for large transactions furthermore the dimensions of a bolt of silk held remarkably steady from the 3rd to the 10th century okay so it's talking about dimensions of a bolt of silk remember bolt is a unit of measurement so it remained steady from the 3rd to 10th century 56 cm wide and 12 m long okay so the dimension stayed steady is what it's saying the values of different textiles were also more stable than the fluctuating values of coins okay so several advantages of textiles have been listed here okay if you want to take a quick note you can even summarize the advantages if you want right so supply is an advantage right um weight is an advantage and then it says that it was stable in terms of dimensions and it was also steady in terms of value right so if you want you can you can take a quick note about the different advantages of textiles as well right okay now one thing that i want to discuss here folks is and uh, remember this that reading comprehension typically what happens is that you face difficulties in reading comprehension one of the major reasons is that you're not familiar with the construction of a sentence okay different authors have different writing styles some of them use either complex constructions or constructions that are not very common and if you're not familiar with that construction it will it will sort of you'll you'll have difficulty in understanding those sentences right so one thing to note here is so for instance if you look at this sentence right just a just a simple tip here it uses this colon okay you see that so what happens typically in a colon is and let's read this sentence it says furthermore the dimensions of a bolt of silk held remarkably steady from third story i'll read it again furthermore the dimensions of a bolt of silk held remarkably steady from the 3rd to the 10th century okay then there is a colon and it says 56 cm wide and 12 m long now what is the use of the colon there think about it for a minute why do you have a colon there okay the colon is there simply because sorry just give me one second i'm having problems with my headphone so sorry about it just think about the colon i'll 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 get back to you Yeah, these headphones are not the best headphones so I, i often have those issues with it sorry about that okay so um yeah so let's look at the colon so what it is it says whenever you have a colon right see this 56 cm wide wide and 12 m long is just illustrating the previous part so whatever is there before the colon is being illustrated by what is there after the colon so they're connected so usually with a colon right and this is a colon right usually with a colon you will see that the right hand side of the colon will usually illustrate what is mentioned on the left hand side of the colon right so it's just giving you additional details or it's giving you an example so here it's talking about dimensions and then it's giving you the exact dimension after the colon okay so just keep that in mind 
Great. So what have we discussed so far? We've discussed about the three currencies, advantages and disadvantages of coins, and we've discussed advantages and disadvantages of textiles as well. Okay, let's proceed. All right. The government also required the use of textiles for large transactions. So it's continuing to discuss about textiles. Remember, we had um, coins, textiles and grains. Okay, so it's continuing to discuss about textiles. It says government has required the use of textiles for large transactions. Coins, on the other hand, were better suited for small transactions. And this is a repeat of a previous point, right? So coins are great for smaller transactions, but government required the use of textiles for large transactions and possibly given the costs of transporting coins for a more local usage. So what does it say? Coins were suited for smaller transactions. Okay. And also possibly given the costs of transporting coins for a more local usage. So it's talking about the cost of transporting coins. So considering the cost of the transporting coins, they were more suited for a local usage. So basically what we can infer is that transporting coins was most likely expensive, right? So because it was expensive, they couldn't move around the coins to sort of like further areas. That's why they restricted the usage to local. Okay, because the transportation of coins was expensive. That, that's what it's, uh, what it's trying to say. Then it starts talking about grain, which is the third currency. Grain, because it rotted easily, was not used nearly as much as coins and textiles. Okay, so grain, the usage was less because it used to rot easily, which would make sense. But taxpayers were required to pay grain to the government as a share of their annual tax obligations and official salaries were expressed in weights of grain. Interesting. Now imagine a world where your salary that your company gives you comes in comes in the equivalent of grain. That's that's really that's a funny sort of like uh, thought right now, right? But this was way back in the day where the official salaries were actually expressed in weights of grain. Okay. So what is what is this um, paragraph talking about? Now you need to summarize. Let's say if you want to summarize the main idea on a note, right? So of course it talks about. Um, Textiles and coins, right? How coins were better suited for small transactions, but the main idea is focused on grain. Okay, so it talks about the disadvantage, which is it rotted easily. Okay, and then it also talks about that in spite of that, tax, a part of tax was paid in grain, and official salaries were also paid in grain. Okay, so that's the main, main idea of the paragraph, mostly about grain the disadvantage and what not really an advantage, but in spite of the disadvantage, you know, what used to happen. So a portion of tax and official salaries. All right. That's the point in the paragraph. Now let's look at the last paragraph. In, a, in actuality, in actuality, our own currency system today has some similarities, even as even as it is changing in front of our eyes. Okay, so now it's drawing a similarity with our own currency system, which is a bit difficult to believe, right? I mean, think about it. They were paying in grains and um, textiles and stuff. So how can we draw similarities, right? So one similarity that you can think of is coins. We still use coins, right? So what the author is saying is that our own currency system has some similarities, even as it is, even as we see it changing in front of our eyes, our currency system is changing. We have cash. Okay, we definitely have cash. So coins for small transactions like paying for parking at a meter and bank notes for other items. Okay. So now we have cash and we have a hyphen here. So what it's doing is we have cash. Okay. And read it uh, with the punctuations. So if there is a comma pause when you're reading, if there is a full stop pause, it just helps you in comprehension. So similarly, what the hyphen here is doing is it says we have cash and then it gives you examples of cash, right? So we have coins for small transactions and bank notes. Both is both are examples of cash. That's why you have an hyphen there. Okay. Checks and debit cards, debit credit cards for other often larger types of payments. So cash for smaller, uh, smaller transactions and checks and debit credit cards for larger types of payments. At the same time, we are shifting to electronic banking and making payments online. Some young people never use cash and do not know how to write a check. Okay. Interesting. So what's the main, main idea of this uh, paragraph? Think about it. It's basically drawing similarity between the Tang system. Remember, it was from the Tang dynasty and the current system. So it's talking about two currency systems and it's drawing similarities, right? Between uh, what used to happen in Tang and what used to happen in current system. So this definitely talks about the current system while drawing a comparison with the 
Tang Dynasty system. Okay. All right. So I, I'll, I'll take your questions in a bit. I'm sure you have some questions. I'm not checking chat. I'll come down to it. But folks, um, this was the passage, right? We've taken some notes. Let's try to, we've understood like paragraph by paragraph and hopefully we maintained the flow as well. If I were to ask you, what's the main idea of this passage, right? So think about it. The main idea of this passage is talking about the three different currencies which were used in the Tang Dynasty, right? It talks about coins, it talks about textiles, it talks about grains. And then in the last paragraph, it draws a similarity. But the main sort of idea here is it sort of discusses the currency system which was there way back in the Tang Dynasty in the form of coins, textiles and grain. That's the main idea of the passage. Okay. All right. Now, before we go to questions, uh, we've discussed the passage. Now, what, what I need you to tell me is if there's something which is not clear, okay, in this passage, if any construction is throwing you off or if any word is not clear, let me know in chat and I'm happy to repeat that part again. Okay. Okay, so Pritzi says, um, okay, before that, I'll come down to the question. There are some interesting comments here. Uh, let's see. I'm just going through chat, folks. Just give me a minute. Yeah, Kiran says, imag Kiran says imagine getting 100 centimeters long textile as loan. Right, Kiran. So that's, that's interesting, right? Think about it. If loan was a currency, sorry, if uh, textiles was a currency, you could have gotten, you would have gotten your loans in textiles as well. Okay, that's it's a funny thought right now. And see, this is good. When you have these thoughts in your head, what it indicates is that you're showing interest in the passage, right? This is a sign of interactive reading. So do that when you're reading this, right? It's okay. You know, you're finding something funny. You're finding something odd. Sometimes you agree with the author. Sometimes you disagree with the author. Talk to the author as you're going through the passage. That will also help you in comprehension. Okay. All right. So, um, Princey, your question is first para last four lines. First para last four lines. Let's go through that. Just give me one second. Okay, um, <clears throat> so first para was about, and we can see a note as well, advantages and disadvantages of, of coins apart from the intro. Okay, all right. Now, see this particular, let me just, uh, one second. All right, so... And first para last four sentences are these. Okay. Let's try to understand this again. Yeah, this is a little bit of a tricky sentence. Okay. Now, one thing that I want to tell you here is folks, when you're reading these passages, right? Yes, you're supposed to read each and every sentence. Okay. When you're reading it for the first time before you go to the questions, that's, that's, that's a good strategy to have. Although you have to read each and every sentence, remember, you don't have to understand each and every word. Okay. There are some words, there are some sentences that you won't understand. Okay. It's fine. Don't bother about it. Don't aim to understand 100%. That means each and every word in sentence in the first read. That might not happen and it's okay. As long as you can understand the main idea of each paragraph, you're good to go. Okay. So for instance, if, if in this case, right, when you're reading this paragraph, by the time you reach here, okay, you understand that the main idea is advantages and disadvantages of coins right this part is just talking about the second disadvantage of coins even if you don't understand it it's okay move on and then when you if you if you have a question which is specifically about this part you can reread that part again okay this saves time so just remember this it's a myth that you have to understand 100 percent of the passage in the first read most of the people don't and it's fine the objective should be to understand the main idea of each paragraph correctly and then the main idea of the passage as well. Some sentences, if they're throwing you off, move on, come back to it if there's a question related to it. Okay. But for the sake of this discussion, of course, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to answer this. So what does it say? One of the main objections to calls for taxes to be paid in coin was that peasant producers who could weave cloth or grow grain 
the other two major currencies of time would not be able to produce coins okay so this is a disadvantage of coins right so what it means is that the call for tax was coming from government obviously and peasant producers had an objection to that so the government was asking them to pay taxes in coin the peasant producers objected to that and their rationale was that we weave cloth and grow grain okay those are the two acceptable currencies so why don't you take the tax in cloth or grain why are you insisting on coins right and it's kind of funny their objection is that we won't be able to produce coins obviously right they can't produce coins but they can produce cloth or grain so that's why they were objecting that you know why don't why doesn't the government accept cloth and grain as well apart from coins as taxes so that's what the sentence means now one thing to note here is see these two hyphens now there are two hyphens here now what's happening here is if you understand this part the part that is enclosed between the hyphens it's actually additional information and this often happens you know different authors have different writing styles some authors do that so what the, what the author has done is they've enclosed the additional part okay between two hyphens so if you're getting confused try to read the sentence let me just remove there's a lot of notes now if you're confused about this try to read this sentence without this bit see this is additional information the one that is between the hyphens remove that and read the sentence so one of the main objections to calls for taxes to be paid in coin was that peasant producers who could weave cloth or grow grain would not be able to produce coins and therefore would not be able to pay the taxes see if you remove that additional bit it makes sense okay so if this sentence is confusing you remember when you have two hyphens most likely the part between the hyphens is additional you can skip that and read the remaining point if the sentence is confusing you right again this talks about construction of sentences and that's what i said the more you read the more you will get familiar with different kinds of constructions right and that will help you in rc because often the construction will throw you off okay all right um any other questions folks any other parts that you didn't understand let me just quickly check chat all right so somebody is asking me what's the difference between brackets and hyphens uh interesting question i think that's kiran who's asking me that question so see brackets uh, uh understand that bracket is giving you additional information here again it says governing an empire of some 60 million people during the tang dynasty it's giving you the time period of tang dynasty so brackets here is giving you additional information about the time period of tang dynasty that's what it's doing here also similarly these two hyphens the middle part of this the other two major currencies of the tang this is additional information connected to the previous sentence okay so it says weave cloth or grow grain and then it's talking about okay cloth and grain are the two other major currencies of tang so it's giving you information about the previous part in this case it's quite similar the way the brackets and uh, hyphens are being used okay all right so additional information that's the main point here all right folks let's move on so uh, we've understood the passage hopefully you guys are okay with that and um, let's try to okay so prince you have a question it says but if they're producing cloth and grains they would sell that for coins and pay tax on coins also so why are they objecting right prince you have a point here that's why i said the objection there is a little weak right that objection also when i read it it didn't make sense to me right so they can sell it to and they can have coins and they can pay taxes i guess the point here was convenience right they had grains they had cloth and they could produce that so they were offering to pay that in tax rather than coins which they couldn't produce so it's kind of a weak objection and that hasn't really been elaborated in the passage okay so it's fine to have that question you don't need sort of in depth understanding you can move on if there is a question related to that we'll discuss it okay all right folks so let's do question 1 um in the context of the passage which one of the following can be inferred with regard to the use of currency during the tang era okay now remember read the question very slowly which of the following can be inferred with regard to the use of currency during the tang era now inference remember means that you have to 
basically understand based on the information available in the passage what can you understand so what you're trying to do in an inference is you look at a passage and you draw understanding based on the information given the passage that's an inference so inferences remember can be explicitly stated or inferences are something that you'll have to read between the lines it can be both okay so that's what you have to do now with regard to the use of currency during the tangera what can you infer look at the four options please look at all the four options and then let me know what you think is the correct answer and then we'll discuss it yeah kiran kiran says i guess the point was lack of copper to make coins yes kiran that can also be the case there was a shortage of coins so the peasant producers must be having difficulty to sort of acquire coins and pay taxes so it's possible that's that's also a point okay which somehow a weak objection was my was my point it wasn't very clear in the passage which is okay okay so i'm getting answers now uh, i'm getting a lot of alphas okay and i'm getting i've got on a charlie as well which is c all right let's have some more answers folks nibin nibin m benny has a question which says inference can't be repeated phrase right so see nibin that's not a guarantee okay typically of course it won't be that way uh, you know it it won't be you know like chances of an inference an option being given which is the same wording as the passage is very rare that won't happen but an inference can be a rewording of what's been mentioned in the passage right so copy of the words that won't happen they won't make it that easy for you but it can be a rewording it can be a rephrasing or it can be something that you'll have to read between the lines okay so there's a delta as well let's discuss this okay okay now what can you infer with regard to the use of currency during the tangera let's look at all the options currency usage was similar to that of modern times okay there's definitely a mention of that right in the last paragraph they draw similarity between that currency system of tangera to the modern system so can you draw this inference that currency usage was similar to that of modern times you can okay so let's hold on to this let's hold this is potentially the correct option but let's see if we have a better option remember you have to choose the best possible option okay so look at all the options currency that deteriorated easily was not used for official work this is not true and you can go back and check the passage in the link official salaries were paid in grain and grain was easily deteriorated okay so this you can't infer because this is wrong you can't infer this because it clearly says that grain was used and grain was deteriorated easily so that's gone copper co coins were more valuable and durable than textiles okay interesting points since a lot of you have chosen just give me a minute copper coins were more valuable and durable than textiles okay so we have two points valuable and durable okay does does it say it would more durable there is a point which says that right when they're comparing textiles with coins and you can see the passage it does talk about the fact that textiles used to show wear and tear okay so they were not durable whereas coins were durable okay so that is there does it say coins were more valuable than textiles it doesn't say that okay there is nowhere in the passage where it indicates that copper coins were more valuable than textiles in fact it said copper coins for smaller transactions textiles for larger transactions but it never said that copper coins were more valuable okay so be careful of these options you will see durable and you'll be like oh you know this is this seems true but then there's also an element about valuable which is not true so you can't draw this inference okay so this is gone grains were the most used currency because of government requirements is that something that you can infer right it just says that a part of tax was paid in grains and official salaries were paid in grains it never says that it was the most used currency because of government requirements so we have ruled out three options the correct option is indeed a okay all right this should be this should be clear let's go to question 2 but of course if you have questions about this i can answer it later let's move on question number 2 according to the passage the modern currency system okay shares all the following features with that of tang except please understand this question what is it saying it's talking about the similarity between modern currency and the tang system again the last paragraph okay 
but it's saying except. So basically what this means is that out of four options that are given to you, three will be the similarities, okay, between uh, Tang and the modern currency system and one will not be a similarity. And one, that one will be the correct option because it says except. So you have to choose an option which is not a similarity between modern currency system and tag according to the person. Okay, so understand that question and tell me what the correct answer is. Okay, I'm getting a lot of uh, deltas and bravos. Okay, so let's see, we have bravos and deltas. Okay, all right. Okay. Bravos and deltas. Okay, great. Now, one thing which is very good here is that you guys are on the right track. So well done on that. Okay, clearly, uh, whoever said uh, bravo and delta, you guys are on the right track. Bravo and Delta is quite close. Okay, it's very close. This is actually a very tricky question and I'll explain to you why. Okay, and let's spend a little bit of time here. This is one of those questions in CAT. Okay, one of the trickiest questions I would say, arguably one of the trickiest questions in verbal ability in RC that appeared in CAT 2020. And you'll understand why. Okay, let's try to understand this. It's talking about similarity of modern currency system and time. Okay, so before we go to Bravo and Delta, let's quickly talk about Alpha and Charlie. It uses different materials as currency. Is this a similarity? Clearly it is, right? We had uh, grains, textiles and coins and in the modern system, we have banknotes, coins, debit cards, credit cards. So this is a similarity. Remember, we're looking for accept. So this is not our answer. Don't get confused. Let's look at Charlie. It uses different currencies for different situations. That's true. In the Tang Dynasty, coins were used for large transactions, textiles were used for, sorry, coins for small transactions, textiles for large transactions. In the modern day, also we have uh, cash, which is being used for small transactions and credit debit card for large transactions. You can go back to the last paragraph, you'll know this, that this is correct. Okay, so both these options are gone. Elimination. Now we're left with Bravo and Delta. Okay, let's understand this. Let's go to Delta first. It is undergoing transformation. Is this a similarity between the Tang system and the modern system? Okay, let's understand this. The last paragraph, if you look at it, it says in actuality, our own currency system today has some similarities, even as it is changing in front of our eyes. So it talks about the modern system, which is changing in front of our eyes. So it's undergoing a transformation. It definitely talks about that, that the modern system, the system today is changing in front of our eyes. That is true. Does it say anywhere in the passage that the Tang system also underwent a transformation? Does it say that? We have to look for a similarity, right? Okay. We have to understand whether it's a similarity or not. We know that the modern system went with a went through a transformation or it's going through a transformation right now. We can see that. Is there anywhere it mentions that Tang system went through a transformation? It doesn't mention that. Okay, so this is a possible answer because of this reason. So let's hold on to this. Now let's look at Bravo. Okay, and this is where it gets really confusing. It says its currencies fluctuate in value over time. Now, is this a similarity that's been expressed for both Tang and modern? Let's try to understand it. See, for Tang, it does talk about currency fluctuation, right? So let's look at that. Let's go back. I'll clear these notes. See, it says, if you look at this sentence, it talks about when you cut textiles, that to greatly lessen the value of textiles. And then it says stained, faded and torn bolts of textiles had less value than brand new bolt. Look at this sentence. 
So basically what happened was as the textiles grew older, okay, and they showed wear and tear, the value lessened. So that was fluctuation. That was fluctuation in this particular currency. So the fluctuation happened in Tang. That is mentioned in the paragraph. Where does it say that the fluctuation happened for the modern system as well? If you read this passage or if you read this paragraph, the last one, the point is not directly mentioned that uh, that modern currency also goes through fluctuation. It doesn't mention that. OK, so now this is a problem, right? Because you're stuck with B and D. Both seem correct because Bravo doesn't talk about the fluctuation in modern times. Delta, there is no transformation in the Tang dynasty. So which one do you choose? OK, now this is a tricky one. The reason the correct answer is Delta. And the reason why Delta is correct is, and this is again, it's, as I said, it's a tricky question. So just bear with me here. The correct answer is Delta and not Bravo, because see, we understood that Tang, there was fluctuation in terms of textiles. The thing is, if you look at Tang and modern day, one currency that was used in both these times was coins. Do you agree with that? Coins were used both in Tang and modern dynasty. And there's also a point in the passage. Just let me get. Uh, yeah, exactly. If you look at this line, it says the values of different textiles were also more stable than the fluctuating values of coins. So again, it also talks about the fluctuating value of coins in the Tang dynasty. Right. And coins were common between Tang and modern system. So that's why we can draw a loose inference. And again, I'm saying a loose or a weak inference that because coins were used in modern time as well, they also fluctuated. And that's why the answer is not Bravo and it's Delta. Okay, I know this will be difficult to digest, but remember, this is one of those rare questions in CAT, okay, where the information was not clear in the passage. But it's a very loose inference that you have to draw because coins were used in both and coins fluctuated in Tang, we can say that coins fluctuated in modern as well. OK, see, ultimately, how you solve these questions is you are left with B and D. You just have to choose the best option. In case of D, there is no doubt at all. OK. Transformation was only spoken about with the context of modern system. There was no transformation in tank. So there is no doubt in D, but there is some bit on doubt in B because of coins. So that's why we end up choosing D. Yeah, so Shweta, as I said, right, uh, Delta is stronger because it's clearly the passage clearly says in the last paragraph that modern system underwent a transformation, but there is no mention of transformation in time about time. That's why we're choosing D. But in Bravo, you can draw an inference. See, it talked about coins fluctuating in time. Coins were majorly used or are majorly used in the current system as well. So we can draw a weak inference or a loose inference that coins fluctuated here as well. Okay. Again, not the most easiest questions. And as somebody said, when the passage is easy, the questions are often tricky, which is what's going to happen. So a complicated passage typically has simple questions. So don't run away from a complicated passage because the questions will be simple. But because this passage was quite straightforward and in CAT, if you think about this, this passage across the slots was one of the easiest passages in terms of content, but the questions were very tricky. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Spend some time, folks, when you watch the recording and think about this. Okay. It's it's quite tricky. I, I admit to that. Let's go to question three. When discussing textiles as currency in the tank period, the author uses the word steady and stable to indicate all of the following except. Again, another except. Okay. So the author definitely mentions steady and stable with reference to textiles as a currency. Go to the paragraph and look at that in your in the link and uh, choose an option keeping accept in mind okay. so three options um, will be connected to steady and stable one option will not be connected you have to choose that particular option
folks make sure you're evaluating all the options before giving your answer and cross check it with the passage also if there is a doubt cross check it if you've chosen the right uh, right option you should have a clear rationale why you're choosing the option that you're choosing okay so i'm i'm seeing answers again uh, uh, i see two options good the fact that you're able to zero down on two options is a good sign folks right in this in this stage of the preparation uh, your answers are quite sort of you you seem to be on the right track which is a good thing okay so maintain that uh, people are choosing charlie and delta okay again a little close let's try to understand that okay steady and stable there's a particular paragraph that talks about that you should know that it clearly there's a paragraph that talks about steady and stable let's look at that okay so we are discussing textiles and with reference to textiles the word steady and stable was used we have to choose the option which is not connected to steady and stable okay let's look at that Yes, this is where it talks about it. Just give me one second. Okay, this is the paragraph that it talks about textiles with reference to steady and stable. Just give me one second. Okay, you have um, stable here and you have steadier. Okay, so let's read this paragraph. So textiles had some advantages over coins, which we figured. Uh, textile production was widespread and there were fewer problems with supply. So again, we took that note also, right? So textiles advantages, supply was an advantage, okay? Then it said that it was steady and stable. Now, why was it steady and stable? Um, for large transactions, textiles weighed less than coins, okay? Furthermore, the dimensions of a bolt of silk held remarkably st steady from the 3rd to the 10th century. So a bolt of silk was used as a currency, bolt as a measurement. The dimension of that bolt remained steady. So that's, it helped in currency because the dimension remains steady. So dimension is connected to measurement. So it's talking about steady measurement, right? The values of te different textiles were also more stable than the fluctuating values of coins. So it talks about steady dimensions, okay, or steady uh, measurements. And it also talks about, um, sorry. And it also talks about stable values. So steady dimension, stable values. Let's look at the option now, uh, question now. Right. <clears throat> now we have reliable measurements. Absolutely. It spoke about steady uh, dimensions. So this is, was a, uh, uh, um, rather was a point that was mentioned with reference to steady and stable. We are choosing except, so this can't be your answer. Okay. Um, was it, was a reliable supply as well? It does talk about that, right? Uh, you have textiles, it compares it with coins and says that textiles didn't have a supply problem. So the supply was steady and stable, but coins had that issue. So reliable supply is also gone. We're looking for except. Now we're left with these two. Okay. There is quality and there is transportation. Now transportation is something that is mentioned in the passage, but transportation is mentioned with reference to coins. In the next paragraph, it said that, you know, coins were difficult to transport or they were expensive to transport. That's why they limited it to local area. But that was in reference to coins. We have to stick to, for this question, we have to stick to textiles and steady and stable. So we have to be within the context of textiles. Transportation was not mentioned in the context of textiles anywhere. Okay. So this is a possible answer. Now between Charlie and Delta, which is close, which is a better answer? Transportation has not been mentioned for textiles at all. Okay. But quality, you can connect it with value. See, think about it. It, it says that the value was stable. Sorry. It says that the value was stable, right? For textiles, you can connect value with quality. How, where does quality come from? Quality comes from the value of the currency. If the value is high, the quality is high, right? So, that's why what they're doing is they've connected this uh, value aspect with quality. That's why it is mentioned with reference to steady and stable. So that's why we are choosing D, which is the correct answer. Quality is being connected to value. Transportation was not mentioned at all for the uh, in the context of textiles. Okay, so we're choosing that. 
let me quickly see if you guys are okay with that all good all right let's go to question four during the tank period which one of the following would not be an economically sound decision for a small purchase in the local market that is worth one eighth of a bolt of cloth please understand this question properly which of the following would not be an economically sound decision so economically sound decision that means it wasn't a great uh, decision money wise is what they're saying for a small purchase in the local market that is worth one eighth of a bolt of cloth okay think about your answer and then we'll quickly discuss that Okay, I know you have some questions about question three. Let me finish this question. I'll come back to it. Okay, Chandravadan, uh, I'll answer your question. Sumiran, Shweta, I'll answer your questions as well. Okay, so I'm getting a lot of alphas for this particular uh, question. Any other option, folks, apart from alpha? Great. So alpha seems to be the uh, the unanimous answer in this case. Let's look at this. Okay. So economically sound decision for a small purchase. Okay. Remember there was something about small purchase and large purchase, right? Uh, coins were better suited for small purchase. Textiles was better suited for large purchases. Remember that point small purchase in the local market that is worth one eighth of a bolt of cloth okay so you're purchasing something which is worth only one eighth of a bolt of cloth okay so let's choose an option which will tell us that this is not an economically sound decision let's look at alpha which you've chosen cutting one eighth of the fabric from a new bolt to pay the amount so there is a bolt okay it has a certain dimension which was mentioned you're cutting the bolt of fabric to one eighth to pay that amount you're choosing this as a decision that is not economically sound. You're absolutely right. And the reason for that is, if you look at the passage, it says, let me just clear the notes. Yeah. It says coins on the other hand were suited for smaller transactions and possibly given the cost of transported coins for a more local usage. Grain because it rotted easily was not used nearly as much as uh, coins and textiles. Sorry, this is not the point. Hold on just one second. Yes, it's here. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, where is that sentence? Yeah, there you go. Furthermore, a full bolt had a particular value, a full bolt of fabric. If customers cut textiles into smaller pieces to buy or sell something worth less than a full bolt, that too greatly lessen the value of textiles. So if you have a full bolt and you're connect cutting one eighth of that bolt, right? So you're cutting one eighth of the fabric. And what it says is that once you cut the fabric or the textile, it greatly lessens the value of the textile. So one eighth of the bolt, the value will lessen. And that's why it's not an economically sound decision. So you guys are absolutely right. That is the correct answer. Okay. The rest of them are either economically sound decisions or not related. So A is the correct answer. Okay. All right, folks. Now, before we move to the next passage, um, I know there were some questions in one second. Yeah, Rajini, you are absolutely right. There were some questions in three. So let's quickly go through that and then we'll go to the next passage. Okay. Right. Now, somebody said that we were cho we have chosen transportation, right? Somebody said that transportation was mentioned with reference to textiles as well. Okay. All right. Now, remember, folks. You have to look for a reference not only for textiles, but within the context of textiles and steady and stable. Remember that. Okay. All these three things should be satisfied for you to choose an answer. 
Okay. Now, if you go back to the passage, where is transportation mentioned? It's mentioned here. Steady and st the steady and stability part was in the previous paragraph, and that topic closed there. Okay. In the next paragraph, it says coins on the other hand were better suited for smaller transactions and possibly given the cost of transporting coins for a more local usage. Here in this paragraph, please understand that in this case, yes, it says government also required the use of textiles for large transactions. Coins were better suited for long, smaller transactions and for more local usage. This part, here they are not comparing coins with, with textiles. So you can't draw an inference here saying that, okay, coins were um, not suited for transportation. So textiles were better suited. That's not what the point here is. They are comparing small transactions and large transactions, but the transportation bit is limited to coins. You can't draw an inference and say that just because um, transporting coins was difficult, it was easier for textiles. That's not true. Okay. The steady and supply bit closed in the last paragraph. So you have to remain within that context. That's why transportation was the correct answer. And somebody also mentioned uh, reliable quality. Okay. So uh, textiles, reliable quality, again, as I said, it's connected to value. That's why we are saying that there is reliable quality. Okay. Transportation is not mentioned with reference to textiles. All right. Okay. All right, folks, in the interest of time, I know we have taken like quite a bit of time to solve this paragraph, but some questions were tricky. So it's uh, definitely for question two. Remember that um, this was a tricky one, right? It was a curveball that cat threw for this particular passage. This happens very rarely when it's when it's I mean, there will be questions where the options will be a little vague. That happens all the time. But this time it was quite vague. OK, like choosing between B and D was quite tricky. So one of questions do creep in and cat. Now in that situation, what you have to do is you just have to go for the best option. So you'll have to spend some time uh, on that question and choose the option that is best, which what we've done in this case. Okay. So this question is definitely tricky. You can go back and review it. All right. Great. We'll go to the next paragraph, uh, next passage now. Now before that, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to sort of mention one quick thing. So if you're not currently a 2IM student, uh, we have an uh, we have a very unique offer running right now, which is basically connected to COVID. Okay, um, what this offer is saying? So, see what we've heard from students is that uh, you know they joined a course in another coaching institute, and because of COVID, their course has been affected. Okay, so there are some institutes um, outside. Unfortunately, they weren't able to continue their courses, so they sort of discontinued the courses because of COVID, and all of them had to shift from offline to online. So some have been able to make that transition transition very well. Some are having difficulty in the online mode. Okay. So what we're hearing from students is that they're having difficulties in these courses. So the offer that we have here is if you are a student of another institute, okay, and you're not happy uh, with the course for whatever reason, if you join our course, you can get a discount up to 50%. Okay. So uh, there are certain conditions that there will be a link on chat. Somebody should post a link on chat. You can check out the description as well. Check out that offer and uh, you know, you can get a discount of up to 50% if you've joined a course in another institute and are not happy with it for whatever reason. Okay. So yeah, consider that offer, have, the, have a look at the details and contact us if you would like to sort of enroll with us using that offer. All right. Great. Should we move on to the next passage folks? Yeah, it was a fun and easy para. Yeah, Kiran, absolutely. Yes, it was. It was one of the easiest passages in CAT 2020. But as you saw, the questions were quite tricky. But the, yes, the passage was quite fun and easy as well. Yes, so uh, introvert speaks. Uh, again, your question is about um, the third question, right? So what introvert speaks, and I'm just using your ID. What he says is that in question three, according to the paragraph, the textiles are said to be faded away, which is related to deterioration of quality. Um, yes. So let's look at that just quickly there. Yes. See, it does talk about, it does talk about, so what it's doing is it's talking about, sorry, 
it's talking about fading stained faded and torn bolts of textiles had less value than a brand new bolt so it's talking about the value bit here that the value went down right yeah i mean the inference that you're making is about quality the the mention here is about value even if you make an inference about quality remember see we are talking about steadiness and stability okay um that is given in this particular paragraph that thought sort of starts and finishes in this paragraph that's why i was telling you limit yourself to this particular paragraph in this case right um the steady in a, the, the stained faded is with reference to value and since we are sticking to steadiness and stability in this paragraph that's why we chose um, quality there and not sorry that's why we chose transportation and not quality okay so yeah uh, definitely this is also tricky it's pretty close but remember delta is a much better answer than uh, than charlie because transportation was not mentioned about textiles at all right that's why we chose delta it's a much better option than charlie you have to choose the best option okay all right folks let's move on okay prince you have a question what is the difference between an introvert and ambivert um, okay this is beyond the context of the passage but i'll quickly answer it introvert is somebody who so there is introvert and extrovert right introvert is somebody who's inward right they sort of uh, like spending time alone in their own company extrovert is a person who likes to spend time with other people right he's more social so introvert and extrovert you have two sort of ends of the spectrum ambivert is somewhere in the middle so most people would be an ambivert like i consider myself an ambivert in some situations i'm an introvert in some situations i'm an extrovert comes in the middle of introversion and extroversion you can look up the meaning okay prince all right let's move on let's look at this passage all right again folks um this is also a passage which is uh, i would say it's not very difficult okay it was also something like easy to medium passage but yeah there are some questions which are a little tricky um i would say the content is a little more complex than coins uh, so that's why you'll see that the questions are a little less easier than coins but again if you look at the overall difficulty of this passage it was somewhere between easy to medium okay all right so yeah just open the link go to that particular passage and let's start discussing it i'll give you about a few seconds and then we'll start talking about it all right folks let's let's get started so we'll read the passage and then we'll solve the questions together okay now just again we'll take notes uh, we'll read it with a lot of interest curiosity and energy and just focus on punctuations a little bit okay so when there's a comma pause your reading a little bit when there's a full stop pause more colon semicolon keep those things in mind these are basic things that just help you in comprehension okay don't let constructions throw you off and if there's a construction that you don't understand you can ask me at the end okay all right Uh, again don't ignore the title okay it's just a placeholder vocabulary used in speech or writing organizes itself in seven parts of speech okay so vocabulary organizes itself in seven parts of speech eight if you count interjections such as oh gosh and some word which says fudged the boy i i don't even know how to pronounce it let's ignore that okay you don't have to understand everything it's in brackets anyway it's additional information okay so vocabulary used in speech or writing organizes itself in seven parts of speech communication composed of these parts of speech must be organized by rules of grammar upon which we agree when these rules break down confusion and misunderstanding result bad grammar produces bad sentences my favorite example from strunk and white is this one as a mother of five with another one on the way my ironing board is always up okay now what is the main idea of this paragraph now there will be some parts in this paragraph which you will not understand as i said if you can get the main idea of the paragraph you don't have to understand each and every word in sentence like for instance if you're confused by this this is anyway like a crap word just made up word don't worry about it now there is a joke at the end this is sort of a joke if you don't understand the joke now don't spend like 5 minutes understanding the joke it's not important if there is a question we'll come back to it just understand the main part of the paragraph what is it saying see the main it starts by talking about vocab then it goes to communication then it goes to grammar if you understand there are two main points here it talks about communication there are two parts to it there is vocab and there is grammar 
okay it says that and then there's a major chunk of the paragraph talks about the importance of grammar so it does start with vocabulary it goes to communication but if you look at this this whole part talks about grammar the importance of grammar it says bad grammar produces bad sentences confusion and misunderstanding result when these rules break down and then it gives you a joke not important to understand the joke all right okay i can explain the joke later on if you want but yeah it it talks about the importance of grammar and it starts talking about vocabulary as well but grammar is sort of like the main point in the paragraph okay let's move on nouns and verbs are the two indispensable parts of writing okay again it's elaborating on grammar nouns and verbs are part of grammar without one of each no group of words can be a sentence since a sentence is by definition of group of words containing a subject noun and a predicate verb okay and then there is a semicolon so semicolon is a pause so let's stop there okay i'll explain to you what a semicolon does so it says nouns and verbs are two indispensable parts of writing indispensable means something that you can't avoid it's a it's a very critical part of writing you can't ignore that so when something is indispensable you can't ignore it okay so what it's saying is nouns and verbs are two critical parts of writing that you can't ignore so if you want to write you will have to understand nouns and verbs it it that's what indispensable means okay without one of each no group of words can be a sentence since a sentence is by definition subject and predicate which is noun and verb okay all right these strings of words begin with a capital letter end with a period and combine to make a complete thought which starts in the writer's head and then leaps to the readers so what's the main idea it's talking about now first it spoke about importance of grammar they are becoming specific now and they are talking about importance of nouns and verbs in grammar so when it says that they are indispensable part of writing to form a sentence you need a noun and a verb okay that's what it is now quickly see folks semicolon you have to pause there but it's different from a full stop so typically when authors use semicolon right what they are doing here is if you look at semicolon will combine two independent sentences okay so you have this and you have this a semicolon combines two independent sentences but now the question is why are they using a full stop they are combining it because these these two sentences are very closely related to each other so semicolon combines two independent sentences yes they are independent but they are very closely related so to to signify the relation they they use a semicolon okay so here how are they related see and again if you read this sentence like uh, in one shot you will get confused it's a very long sentence so break it up so it talks about um, since the sentence is by definition a group of words right these strings of words so when they say these strings of words they are talking about the sentence that's how it's connected so you have a group of words containing a subject and predicate these strings of words so the group of words containing subject and predicate the string refers to that okay so they say that this group of words begin with a capital letter end with a period and have a complete thought so they just basically talking about how a sentence is constructed but the main idea is importance of nouns and verbs all right so don't let the semicolon throw you off let's move on <clears throat> must you write complete sentences each time every time is a question that the author is asking you perish the thought so he's telling you perish the thought perish means get rid of the thought destroy it that's what perish means right so destroy the thought is what the author is telling you that means you don't need to write complete sentences each time every time let's look at that if your work consists only of fragments and floating clauses the grammar police aren't going to come and take you away right so it's basically telling you that it's not important to write complete sentences each time every time right and it gives you a funny sort of like word here it's saying that even if you make a mistake even if you write an incomplete sentence the grammar police is not going to come and take you away right so it's not important to write complete sentences each time every time that's what the author is saying here okay let's read further even william strunk now strunk remember was mentioned in the beginning even william strunk the that muscolony of rhetoric recognized the delicious pliability of language okay it is an old observation he writes that the best writers sometimes disregard the rules of rhetoric okay interesting now this is a li little bit complicated now what is he trying to say here we already know that he says that it's not important to write complete sentences each time every time we know that 
he elaborates on that. So he says that William Strong, who is a Mussolini of rhetoric. So there is rhetoric, which is a word that you might not have, uh, that you might not know, and pliability is also a word that is not very common. So it's to, it's a little difficult to understand the sentence if you don't know the meaning of these words. Okay, so let's try to understand what rhetoric means. See, rhetoric. By the way, it's not a very, very rare word, so you should definitely know what rhetoric is. Rhetoric is persuasive and forceful language. Language which is very persuasive and very forceful. That is rhetoric. Okay, so he's calling, uh, he's saying William Strunk, the Mussolini of rhetoric. That means William, William Strunk was known for his rhetoric, was known for his forceful and persuasive language. And pliability means flexibility. If something is pliable, it's flexible. Okay, so now if you've understood the meaning, it says the Mussolini of rhetoric, he was famous for uh, forceful and persuasive, persuasive language. He also recognized the flexibility of language. So although he was very good with language, he was known to write persuasive and forceful language. He recognized that the language is flexible. Okay, and then he says it's an old observation. So basically this is um, William Strunk. William Strong's quote that the best writers sometimes disregard the rules of rhetoric. So what it's saying is that even the best writers disregard the rules of, of the rhetoric of language. And what are the rules of language? Grammar are the rules of language. Okay. So even the best writers sometimes disregard those rules, which kind of connects to the previous thought. The previous thought said it's not important to write complete sentences each time, every time. That means you can ignore the rules. Then it says that even William Strunk, who was great at language, you said that sometimes best writers disregard the rules of rhetoric or rules of grammar. Okay, right. Yet he goes on to add this thought, which I urge you to consider. Unless he's certain of doing well, the writer will probably do best to follow the rules. Interesting. So the passage, the paragraph till now is talking about um, that, you know, it's Okay, sometimes you can disregard the rules of grammar. That's what he's, that's what the uh, paragraph says till this part. Okay, that it's okay to disregard the rules of grammar sometimes, right? Or you don't have to follow the rules of grammar strictly every time. So we can say that, okay, okay to disregard grammar rules sometimes. All right, that's the idea till now, till till that part. But then he says, uh, William Strunk again, the quote of William Strunk, unless he's certain of doing well, he means meaning a writer. Unless a writer is certain of doing well, the writer will probably do best to follow the rules. So what what they're saying is that what it's okay to disregard grammar rules sometimes. But if you are a writer who's disregarding grammar rules, be certain of doing well. So there is a condition, right? It's okay to disregard rules, but if you're disregarding rules, make sure that you are confident of what you're writing. Okay. And only then disregard the rules. If you're not confident about what you're writing, then it's best to follow the rules. So they're putting a condition here. It's a conditional statement that you can disregard the rules provided you know what you're doing. Okay. Interesting. Let's, let's see if it elaborates on that. And it does. The telling clause here is unless he's certain of doing well. Telling clause basically means the important clause. So the important part for you to consider is this part, unless he's certain of doing well. What does this mean? If you don't have a rudimentary grasp of how the parts of speech translate into coherent sentences, how can you be certain that you're doing well? Rudimentary means basic. Okay. So if you don't have a basic grasp of how the parts of speech translate, how can you be certain that you're doing well? How will you know if you're doing ill for that matter? The answer, of course, is that you can't, you won't. It's a little bit of a complex sentence. So what it's saying is, if you're a writer, okay, if you're doing well, if you're certain that you're doing well, you can disregard the rules. But how will you know that you're doing well or not? As a writer, you will know whether you're writing well or not, only if you have a basic grasp of grammar. Okay, let's take an analogy. Let's say if you if you're cooking, okay, um, you're cooking a dish, right? How would you know whether the dish is going properly? So when you're cooking, how do you know whether you're cooking it properly or not? You need to know the basics of cooking. Okay, 
if you don't know the basics of cooking you will not be able to judge while cooking whether a dish is going in the right direction or not so for instance if you're somebody who's cooking right and you're interested in cooking you add the masalas you add the spices right the spices have to cook a little bit before you go to the next step and how we determine that is by the smell so the spice the smell is raw you know that the spices are not cooked you will wait but if the smell is sort of like not raw you know that you can move to the next step so this is a basic of cooking if you know this basics you will know whether it's going well or not if you don't know the basics you will be blind you will have no idea whether it's going well or not well and it will be left to chance whether the dish works or not okay so what they are trying to say is that if the writer is doing well he can disregard the rules but he will only know whether he is doing well if he knows the basics of grammar okay so it's important to know the basics of grammar that is the main idea of this paragraph okay let's read the remaining one one who does grasp the rudiments of grammar rudiments is basics finds a comforting simplicity at its heart where there need be only nouns the words that name and verbs the words that act so the main idea here is that the basics of grammar are important it's important to know the basics of grammar that's the main idea okay and in the last sentence it says that if you understand the basics you'll find them simple because it's after all it's about nouns and verbs right the basic building blocks of grammar that's the main idea of this paragraph okay it's a little complex you'll have to spend some time but of course if you are not clear i will i will come back to it but the main idea is basics of grammar are important so look at the flow right previous paragraph he said that okay it's okay to disregard grammar rules but then he says be certain of what you're doing and then disregard and how will you be certain by knowing the basics okay so that's the main point here that the basics of grammar are important okay let's move on <clears throat> take any noun put it with any verb and you have a sentence okay again it's talking about nouns and verbs right at the basic building blocks of grammar so take a noun take a verb and you have a sentence it never fails rocks explode jane transmits mountains float these are all perfect sentences it's true these are sentences two word sentences but this is a sentence there's a noun and a verb many such thoughts make little rational sense but even the stranger ones like plums defy have a kind of poetic weight that's nice okay so what it's saying is that the basics of grammar is very simple you take a noun take a verb combine into a sentence and it makes sense sometimes it might not make sense but even the stranger ones have some poetic words so you can use that in poetry if nothing else the simplicity of noun verb construction is useful okay at the very least it can provide a safety net for your writing okay so again the simplicity of noun and verb in grammar strunk and white caution against too many simple sentences in a row but simple sentences provide a path you can follow when you fear when you fear getting lost in the tangles of rhetoric all those restrictive and non restrictive clauses those modifying phrases those appositives and the compound complex sentences now look at this see this is all even if you don't understand in the first go folks it's right you don't have to understand each and every word just understand the main point okay what they are saying is that noun and verb the they were talking about basics of grammar now they're talking about noun and verb this is important to understand and once you understand this you can form simple sentences so it's important to understand nouns and verbs the basics of grammar it's an extension of the thought in the previous paragraph okay so if you know how to form a simple sentence that can help you when you are getting confused so as a writer if you get confused with sentences or you don't know how to express your thoughts just use simple sentences is what they are saying but they also caution against using too many simple sentences in a row so don't use too many simple sentences but yes simple sentences can help you when you're confused as a writer okay if you start to freak out at the sight of such unmapped territory unmapped by you just remind yourself that rocks explode jane transmits mountains float and plums defy grammar is the pole you grab to get your thoughts up on their feet and walking okay so it's saying that grammar is simple okay main idea of the paragraph is you have simple grammar rules okay connected to noun and verbs that you should know and these simple grammar rules will really help you to express your thoughts 
Okay, the last sentence is important, right? Grammar is the pole you grab to get your thoughts up on the feet and walking. So simple grammar rules for expressing your thoughts is what it's saying. Okay, all right. Now, if you look at the central idea, so you've looked at the paragraphs. What is the main idea of the passage? See, it starts by talking about vocabulary, but the focus of the passage is clearly on rules of grammar, right? So what it's saying is the main idea is that it's important to know the basics of grammar. That's what the main idea is. You don't need to be a grammar expert, okay? Uh, but you need to know the basics of grammar and grammar helps you to express thoughts. And it's simple is what the passage is saying. Okay, so that's the main idea. Any part that confused you folks do, that you want me to repeat? Clear folks, anything this is not clear? Let's have some confirmation on chat, please. If you've understood, I can proceed to the questions. Any part that is not clear, folks? Okay, looks like uh, you guys are clear. Just going to wait for a few seconds and then proceed. Should we go to questions? Great. Purov, Purov says all clear. Princey says all these apostives and all other examples. Exactly. Exactly. Princey, absolutely right. Okay. Um, see, it says, but simple sentences provide a path you can follow when you fear getting lost in tangles of rhetoric. So tangles of rhetoric are those advanced grammar rules is what it's talking about. You're absolutely right. That's what it is. You don't really need to understand this in the first reading. Okay. Uh, leave it. It's very technical. If there is a question related to that, we'll come and try to understand it. But we've got the main idea. So it's fine. But you're absolutely right. Okay. So it looks like it's clear. Let's move to questions quickly, guys. Which one of the following quotes best captures the main concern of the passage? Okay. Now, this is similar to the main idea main concern main idea quite similar okay now if you remember i told you last time that whenever you're looking at a main idea question you have to look at the passage as a whole okay don't focus on specific parts focus on the main idea okay uh, let me know the answer and then we'll discuss it Uh, strunk and white strunk and white were the two uh, two people mentioned roshan if you look at the passage strunk and white uh, look at look in the beginning they talk about strunk and white these are two people two people or two writers right that's what it is okay i'm getting some answers let's have some more answers folks uh daksh i'm guessing i'm i'm yeah okay yes you've deleted your message i read a g there and i was like okay there's no option called g and thank God that there are no G's. Thank God that there are only four options and not more than that. It would have become even more complicated. Okay. All right. So I'm getting some deltas. All right. And I'm getting uh, Bravo as well. Okay. Let's have more answers. Okay. There is an alpha as well. Great. Alphas and deltas. Okay. Let's look at it. Which one of the following quotes best captures the main concern of the passage? Now look at the passage holistically, please. Don't focus on specific aspects. You have to understand the passage as a whole to answer this question. It's very similar to main idea. Okay. Now we discussed the main idea of the passage. What was the main idea? That basic rules of grammar are important, right? It's important uh, to express your thoughts. You need to know the basic rules of grammar. If you don't know the basic rules, then there can be a lot of confusion, right? That's the main idea. 
Okay, now let's look at it. Let's look at alpha. Nouns and verbs are the two indispensable parts of writing. Without one of each, no group of words can be a sentence. Okay, see, this is definitely a thought that is mentioned in the passage. They do talk about the importance of knowing nouns and verbs when they're talking about basics of grammar. Okay, but again, look at the passage holistically. What does the passage talk about holistically? It talks about grammar, isn't it? It talks about basic grammar rules. And then grammar ka part is nouns and verbs. Okay, so it talks about basic grammar rules and it says it's important to know nouns and verbs. So yes, alpha is a thought, is a part that is mentioned in the passage. All of them are quotes from the passage. But this is too specific for a question like main concern. Main concern, you have to go broader. You have to look at it holistically. So that's why this is too specific. Okay, let's hold on to it. So we'll have to look for a more general option for this question. But yes, this, this can be correct. Okay, strong and white caution against too many simple sentences in a row, but simple sentences provide a path you can follow when, when you fear getting lost in tangles of rhetoric. This is also a con part that is mentioned. They say that uh, use simple sentences that use nouns and verbs, know the basic rules of grammar. Okay, and you can use simple sentences when you're getting confused as a writer in tangles of rhetoric. Okay. This is an exa exact quote from the passage. But again, this is too specific, folks. The main idea is grammar. Okay. First, it was nouns and verbs. Here, it is talking about simple sentences. This is also connected to grammar. Simple sentences in what form? Simple sentences using nouns and verbs correctly. So, following basic rules of grammar. Again, this comes under the umbrella of grammar. It's a little, little, it's quite specific. Okay. Let's look at Charlie. The telling clause here is unless he's certain of doing well. This is also a very specific part of the passage where he says the writer can disregard rules if he knows he's doing well. Again, too specific for this question. We're looking at main concern. Delta says bad grammar produces bad sentences. Now, this is something that connects to your main idea, which is about following basic grammar rules. If you don't follow them, it will result into confusion. Okay. For these kind of questions, you have to look for a broader option and this broader option connected to the main concern. And this does the job amazingly well. Alpha and Bravo are too specific. Charlie is also very specific. Delta is broad and it connects to the main concern. So that's why Delta is the correct question. Correct answer. Sorry. Is it clear, folks? Is it clear why Delta is the correct answer? Any confusion? I'm just going to wait for a few seconds and then I'll proceed. Any questions for this particular question or should I move on? All right, Shweta, thanks for the confirmation. All right, looks like you folks are clear. Yeah, it's yeah. please, please uh, keep saying yes or no on the chat so that I know that, you know, whether I should proceed or not. But but Pura, Shweta, thank you for that. Let's proceed. Looks like you guys are clear. Remember to pick general options. Okay. All right. Let's do question two. Which one of the following statements, if false, could be seen as supporting the arguments in the passage? Now, this question is a tricky one. Okay. So be careful with this question. Please understand the question very well. Okay. And let me explain to you the question, folks, and then you can attempt it. That will be easier. Which one of the following statements, if false, could be seen as supporting the arguments in the passage? This is, it's very important to understand what this means. Don't get confused. The options are given to you. If the options are false, okay, so there are two conditions for you to choose the right answer. The right answer will be false and it will support. So right option will be false and it will support the argument in the passage. So that's one way of looking at it. Or you can flip this and that will become easier for you to figure it out. False opposite is true, right? And the opposite of support is does not support. 
okay so either you can look at it uh, look at it that way okay you look at make sure that it's false and support or flip it and say true and does not support this is easier i'll tell you why see if you have to these options are given to you if you have to convert them into false you will have to convert each option to opposite currently these options are given to you so these options are considered true if you have to make them false you will have to go for the opposite version of each option and then make sure it supports it becomes quite confusing so the easier part would be take the options as true and choose an option which is true and does not support so if you're considering them as true you don't have to change them to opposite they are true right now just choose an option which does not support so automatically it will answer that question Okay, so there are two ways of going about it. One, you take the opposite of each option and see if it supports. That's difficult. Or you take the options as it is, as true, and look for an option that does not support the argument. Okay, all right, go for it. Okay, Purav, uh, your uh, your request about switching of the slow mode. Okay, so I don't think it will be possible in this stream, Purav, but we can consider that for the next stream. I, I understand what you're saying. So from the next stream, we'll try to uh, reduce the time, the wait time. Okay, all right. Thanks for that suggestion. All right, folks, take a few seconds. It's a tricky question, but let's try to understand it. All right, I'm getting some answers. I'm going to wait for some more time because it's a tricky one. Uh, let's let's have everybody answer it, and then a few more answers, and then we'll we'll proceed. Great. Okay. So I'm getting a lot of, I've only gotten Bravo still now. Okay. Um, so looks like there is unanimity in this, in this question, but if you have any other option, folks, please feel free to mention that. Don't hesitate. We don't know yet whether Bravo is the correct answer or not. Okay. So any other options, any takers for Alpha, Charlie, Delta? Okay, so all of you are going for Bravo. Uh, let's see if that's the correct answer. You're absolutely right. Okay, well done on this question. I'm very, very happy that you, you folks were able to get Bravo. This is a tricky question, folks. Okay, some of you got A, no problem. We'll discuss that. This is a very tricky question. So congratulations on getting it right. Believe me, it's not an easy question. It uses, this, this is a typical question that uses critical reasoning as well, right? You have to use your analytical skills. So I'm very happy that you got it right. Let's not try to understand it. So see, one element of questions is, of course, you got it right, great. But you also have to get it, you also have to get it right for the right reason. Remember that. Sometimes we choose an option 
based on a reasoning in our head which is not correct now that's risky by by chance it worked here but it might not work for other questions so yes it's important to get an option right but it's also important to get it right for the right reasons okay especially when you're preparing so remember that let's try to understand it okay uh, i'm going to clear these notes and then i will again sort of uh, note it down so as i said was false and uh, support it's difficult to do this so go for the opposite which is true and do not support okay in this case you don't need to go for the opposite meaning of the options you can take the options as it is okay let's see alpha an understanding of grammar helps a writer decide if she or he is writing well or not okay so basically we have to look for an option the correct option will be true and it will not support remember that that will be the correct option okay now all of them are true an understanding of grammar helps a writer decide if he she or he is writing well or not this is correct for the passage right this supports the passage right the author says that that you need to have an understanding as a writer the remember the cooking analogy that i gave you it was in connection to that you need to understand grammar basics grammar to know whether you're writing well or not okay so this is true yes but it supports what is mentioned in the passage remember we are looking for something which is true and does not support so this is not our answer okay we'll come back to bravo which is the correct answer let's look at charlie it has been observed that writers sometimes disregard the rules of rhetoric this is true remember strunk made that quote that writers can sometimes disregard the rules of writers even the best writers this is true and this supports but we are looking for true and does not support so this is not the right answer regarding grammar women writers tend to be more attentive to method and accuracy now it's important to understand why you ruled this out remember this is unrelated there is no mention of women and men writers anywhere in the passage they have thrown this option just to confuse you this is unrelated now remember if there is an unrelated point the question of supporting or does not supporting does not arise it's an unrelated point for something to support or do not support it has to be a related point just because it's an unrelated point you can quickly rule it out because it will not do anything to the passage it's completely unrelated it's just there to confuse you right so by elimination also you can come to bravo now just understand bravo it's a little tricky the way that option is mentioned now perish the thought is similar to what is mentioned in the passage but here it's used in a different construction let's try to understand it let's break it up what does it say complete sentences necessarily need nouns and verbs okay complete sentences necessarily need nouns and verbs the option is saying perish the thought when you're perishing something that means you have to go for the opposite it's a little tricky bear with me here complete sentences necessarily need nouns and verbs perish that thought take the opposite of that so the complete sentence does not necessarily need nouns and verbs that's what the option is saying do you get it because of perish the thought you have to take the opposite meaning complete sentences do not necessarily need nouns and verbs okay so that's what you have to consider as true does this support the passage it does not support the passage because the passage says that for complete sentences you need nouns and verbs because nouns and verbs are indispensable remember so indispensable means that they are critical okay so this is true and do not support the true version of this is does not support the passage therefore this is the correct answer okay so very tricky question first you have to remember this part which makes it easier and then for this option you will have to use it because of perish the thought it becomes a little unclear okay and this is not correct just because it mentions perish the thought that's not the reason the reason is you have to analyze it and then figure it out okay let's move on i'll if there's time at the end i can focus on that question 3 all of the following statements can be inferred from the passage except that now there is except again inferred is basically understanding that you can draw from the passage we've seen an example already now three statements you can infer one statement you will not be able to infer so you have to choose the statement that you can't infer because of ex except so three statements will infer and one do not infer and this will be your correct option okay tell me the right answer
Okay, so I'm getting some answers. Shristi, Tushar, Yazini, Prinsi, Vignesh. Uh, you folks are saying bravo. Okay. Uh, there are there is a Charlie as well. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Dwai, Dwai, sorry, Dwai Payan, Ghosh, Mr. Ghosh. I'll refer to you as Mr. Ghosh. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, you say Charlie. Okay. So there are a lot of bravos, some Charlies as well. Any other answer, folks? Few more seconds. Bravo. Okay. Great. Let's discuss it. So a lot of bravos, some Charlies. Let's understand it. So we have to pick an option which does not, which you can't infer from the passage. That should be clear by now. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to focus on Bravo and Charlie because that's where the confusion is. Let me know if you want me to discuss other things. Okay. What does Charlie say? Sentences do not always have to be complete. Can you infer from, can you infer this from the passage that sentences do not always have to be complete? Okay. Let's look at the passage. Must you write complete sentences each time, every time? Perish the thought. If your work consists only of fragments and floating clauses, the grammar police aren't going to come and take you away. So is it compulsory to write complete sentences each time, every time? No. Okay. That's what the passage says. So sentences do not always have to be complete. You can infer this from the passage. It clearly says that, that it's not always compulsory to have complete sentences. You can have incomplete sentences as well. And if you do that, the grammar police is not going to come and take you away. Right? So you can infer this. Okay? Now let's look at B. So this is not the correct answer. The primary purpose of grammar is to ensure that sentences remain simple. What is the primary purpose of grammar? Look at the passage. Look at the main idea. Basic grammar rules are important. Why are they important? Because if you don't follow grammar rules, it will lead to confusion. It will create chaos. Right? Bad grammar, bad sentences or what was that quote from bad grammar produces bad sentences and it creates confusion. So the primary purpose of grammar is to ensure that there is no confusion, to ensure that there is clarity. The primary purpose of grammar is not to ensure that sentences remain simple. Right? That is not the primary purpose. The primary purpose of grammar is to ensure that there is no confusion between the author and the reader. That is the primary purpose. So we can't infer this and this is your correct answer. Okay. All right. Now, just in the interest of time, I uh, we are running out of time. So I won't be able to sort of explain the other options. But remember, uh, this is a common word and maybe in the next session I can talk about it. But please do take some time out to understand what a metaphor is. Okay. Metaphor is a common word that comes in cat passages somewhere. So you need to understand what metaphor is. Okay. It's a simple concept. Don't complicate it. Um, it's a part of, you should understand what literally and figuratively means. Okay. So take this as homework. Okay. Understand what literally means. Understand what figuratively means first. And figuratively is connected to metaphors. So metaphors are always figurative. So understand this and you will understand what a metaphor is. It's important because it comes in quite a few times. Of, we've seen that coming in cat. Okay. But the option here is bravo. Let's move on. Okay. Take any noun, put it with any verb and you have a sentence. It never fails. Rocks transport, explode, Jane transmit, mountains float. Now this is an actual sentence from the passage. None of the following statements can be seen as similar except. Okay. This is an example folks of an extrapolation question. So what it's asking you to do is it's asking you to read this sentence. Take any noun till mountains float understand the relationship in that sentence and choose one of the options that has a similar relationship. Okay, so you have to match the relationship of this statement with the options. Right? And it says none of the following statements can be seen as similar except. Okay, so what this basically means is and again, see you have none and you have except. This is how they confuse you. So basically what it means is that there is only one option here which is similar and three options are not similar. None of the following statements can be seen as similar except. 
So one option is similar, three options are not similar. You have to pick the option that is similar. Okay, right, go ahead. Choose your answer and then let me know. Okay, so I'm seeing uh, some D's, Delta and Bravo as well. Anvesha, Shweta, Yazini, you guys say Delta, Namneet Singh says Bravo. Okay, any other answers, folks? Delta, Raga says Delta. Okay, great. Let's look at this, folks. So uh, a lot of you are saying Delta and I'm seeing some Bravos as well. Okay, let's understand this. Now see, it says, take any noun, put it with any verb and you have a sentence. So what it's saying is you have a noun plus verb equal to sentence, right? That's what the option is saying. And then it says it never fails. It gives you examples of that. Okay. Now we have to look for an option, which is similar. Three options will be not similar. One option will be similar. Okay. Let's look at Bravo and Delta. Take it. Let's start with Bravo. Take an apple tree, plant it in a field and you have an orchard. Okay. So orchard is a collection of apple trees, right? Orchard is just like you have an orchard, which is an area which is full of diff, uh, multiple apple trees. So it's saying take one apple tree, an apple tree, plant it in a field and you have an orchard. So it's basically you have tree which is contained in an orchard. So you have orchard. Okay. And then it's made up of different trees. That's what the relationship there is. Okay. As opposed to Delta, which says take any vegetable, Put some spices in it and you have a dish. So vegetable plus spices equal to dish. Isn't this very similar to what it's in the question? Noun plus verb is equal to a sentence. So building blocks of a sentence are noun and verb. Building blocks of dish are vegetables and spices. It's very similar. Okay. So delta is the correct answer. The reason why Bravo is not the answer is because an orchard is made up of multiple trees. Right? You have an orchard and you have an apple tree. It's talking about two entities. But here you have veg plus spices equal to a dish. So the equation is different. Also another reason is Bravo is an exaggeration. One apple tree is not going to make an orchard. It's an exaggeration. You can't take one apple tree, plant it and expect to have an orchard. You need like many trees. So it's an exaggeration. And the sentence in the question is not an exaggeration. So two reasons why Bravo can't be an, the answer. Delta is a very similar relationship. Okay, and take some time, please, to understand none and accept. This is what it is. Okay, don't get confused. All right, great. Let's look at the last question, folks. Um, we have question number five. Inferring from the passage, the author could be most supportive of which one of the following practices? Okay, so again, inference, uh, you have to draw an understanding from the available information. The author could be most supportive if which one of the following practices? So there are four practices given to you. You have to choose the option which you think the author will be most supportive of. Most is very important. Okay. Best possible option. In all cat questions, you have to choose the best answer. So choose the option that you think the author will be most supportive of based on what is given in the passage. Okay. Go for it. Yes, Rajneet, it is a, the previous one was a clear CR question, critical reasoning question. So it requires language skills and analytical skills. You're absolutely right. A lot of the questions that we discussed today were that crit of critical reasoning um, nature. Okay, folks, 30 more seconds for you to choose the answer and then I'll start.
Okay, Mr. Ghosh, I will learn to pronounce your name next time. I'm sorry about that, but till then you will be you'll be addressed as Mr. Ghosh. Okay, which is a good thing. I'm giving you respect, right? I'm kidding. Okay, Mr. Ghosh says Delta. Princey says Delta. Okay, great. Anvesha also says Delta. Any other answers, folks? Sorry, I'm rushing. Just we have a little bit of time remaining, so I need to complete this. Okay, let's look at it. So a lot of you are choosing Delta. All right, let's understand this. Now let's look at Delta. The availability of language software that will standardize the rules of grammar as an aid to writers. See, understand the passage says that basic rules of grammar are important, right? That is the main idea of the passage that basic rules of grammar are important for writers because if the writer doesn't know the basic rules of grammar, it's going to produce bad sentences and confusion. That's the main idea. Now think about it. If you have a language software that standardizes the rules of grammar, it will help writers. And the author should be supportive of this because the author says basic rules are very important. Now here you have a software that makes this very easy for writers. It standardizes the rules of grammar. So automates it. It basically points out oh, the sentence is wrong, noun and verb and all of that. Okay. So the author should be very supportive of this because it kind of, it completely resonates with the author's opinion that basic rules of grammar are important. So Delta is a, is the correct option. Okay. Now very quickly, don't get confused with Bravo. It's a trap. It says the critique of standardized rules of punctuation and capitalization. Okay. Uh, will the author be supportive of this? The author doesn't say that punctuation and capitalization is not, is not required. The author just focuses on nouns and verbs and the basic rules of grammar. The author doesn't say that punctuation and capitalization should be ignored. Okay. Or is not important. He doesn't talk about that. He just sticks to basic rules of grammar. So that's why Bravo can't be the correct option. The author will not be supportive of this, but the author will be very supportive of a software that standardizes the rules of grammar. Okay. All right, folks. So that brings us to an end of this session. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, um, consider liking the video if you folks enjoyed the session. Otherwise, you can you always feel free to dislike as well. See, the only thing is if you like it, uh, YouTube, the way YouTube works is it shows this video to more and more students. So more and more students can hopefully get value out of it. So consider liking and uh, we'll have this session every week on Friday. We'll have two more passages from slot two. We'll give you the link, read the passages and come prepared for the next session. Okay. All right. Thank you so much and stay safe and good night.